speaking with Andrew Breitbart of the Breitbart Empire of Blogs, Breitbart.com, of course, BigJournalism.com, BigPeace.com, and uh, Andrew's going to be speaking here in just a few minutes at the AFP conference, but Andrew, what I want to ask you about is the Pigford story, because this is something that is so complicated, it's such a complicated story that a lot of us in the conservative blogosphere have just really not had much to say. You guys have been doing a great job writing about this, but it's very complicated. It's hard to get a handle on. I was wondering, I know that uh, I know it's been commented on that it's just not getting a lot of traction quite yet, but there's big things coming up here that we're going to all want to be paying attention to. I mean, there's a short way to sell it, um, and it's controversial, but basically the reparations movement that, took, that had a lot of steam coming out of the Million Man March uh, attempted to find uh, a big pile of money somewhere, whether it be Wells Fargo or other corporations that could be tied to, um, you know, slavery era uh, financial gain and finding just a, a, a big, you know, wallet to, to exploit and sue, and that wasn't really taking hold. And so the reparations movement, which manifests itself in many different ways, and it's something that the average person doesn't pay any attention to, there's Dorothy Tillman, uh, who has a reparations convention, and then there's NCOBRA, which is an organization uh, that has yearly conventions where you'll see speakers like Louis Farrakhan and uh, Reverend Wright, um, or there's the Reparations Dream Team, which includes uh, Charles Ogletree, uh, Obama's law school mentor. Uh, it, it also included Johnny Cochran. Uh, and, and when the Pigford, uh, when the Pigford lead council successfully uh, settled with the government to the tune of one point. Five billion dollars in the year 1999. Uh, Charles Ogletree, from uh, the the organizer of the Dream Team, immediately picked the lead counsel, Al Pires, to join the Reparations Dream Team. And what? How does this tie to Obama? There's a quote from about the year 2000 of Barack Obama that became very popular before the election. It was a discovered. Chicago Public Radio uh, sound clip that probably was about a minute or two long where he talked about the Warren Court not being liberal enough. And he felt that the court system could become the mechanism for economic justice and reparative justice, reparative reparations. And that's exactly the time frame in which the Pigford settlement occurred. Um, Barack Obama's intimate circle of people, including Dorothy Tillman of the Reparations Conference. She's an alderman, former alderman from the Third Ward in Chicago. And Barack Obama, even when his presidency, when he was running for president, endorsed Dorothy Tillman, even against the SEIU candidate at the time. Uh, so all of the people who were involved in Pigford at the very beginning uh, were very much involved in the reparations movement and they found the, the right uh, pot of cash and that was the United States Treasury. Uh, the USDA had been sued many times, including by Shirley and Charles Sherrod, who sued for $80 million and lost in the year 2000, I mean in the year 1997. Shirley Sherrod and her husband and their defunct communal farm re-entered a lawsuit against the United the USDA in the form of the Pigford case. Pig, the Pigford case was initially about 157 farmers who had a grievance uh, with the USDA. Uh, I, our research has come to the conclusion that these people weren't just really discriminated, but they were basically tortured uh, uh, through policies and standards within the USDA to basically try and get black farmers, white farmers off of their land to, to put these people into foreclosure so that either big agribusiness companies could uh, buy this uh, their properties, uh, you know, for pennies on the dollar, or gentlemen farmers uh, could buy. Uh. So this was a legitimate 
this was a legitimate lawsuit. It, originally, the Bigford lawsuit was a legit. They had a legitimate claim against the U.S. government. Not uh, yes, but I, I would argue that it's not a discrimination suit. Uh, it would be it would be a suit that could have been brought by any number of farmers. I can show you white farmers who had the exact same uh, outcome and the exact same experience. Uh, we have a USDA whistleblower uh, from back when that happened who is an advocate for the black farmers and for small farmers in general who would talk about what the USDA does. But uh, Al Pires understood the value of creating a, a, a lawsuit against the government. And after all those lawsuits came and was successfully fought against by the U.S. government for discrimination, Dan Glickman, then head of the USDA under Bill Clinton, out of nowhere apologized for past discrimination within the USDA. That opened it up for the Pigford lawsuit to be brought by Alexander Pires. And the USDA immediately settled. They settled but admitted no wrongdoing, which meant that no one got fired and they didn't have to make any changes to their uh, to their, to their underlying policies. I think that they basically said, we're going to do sensitivity training in the future. But if there were that many people being discriminated against systematically, why, why wasn't there a greater effort to try and root out the bad apples? You'll see why. Because basically it got to the point where uh, the Treasury you know, was going to become an ATM for many, many people. And this lawsuit, which was supposed to help the black farmers, ended up hurting the black farmers. The majority of the black farmers who, uh, who entered this class became immediate uh, uh, critics of it. They complained that their class attorney never consulted with them, that they settled this case without consulting them, and that he created, this is it, this is the story right here, the class attorney created a class at the last second called the attempted to farmer. So the farmers lost their properties. The farmers were supposed to get justice. The farmers are the ones that Barack Obama and Dan Glickman and the political structure talk about. We got justice for the black farmer. The majority of the people, upwards of 92% of the people who got money have never farmed in their lives while the black farmers who were used on television uh, that their justice was being given to them didn't. They systematically began losing their farms. And so they've been complaining since the year 2000 of malpractice by their own attorneys. But what happened is the more people that entered the Pigford class when there are only supposed to be two to 3,000 farmers that were going to get their money, it started building and building and building to the point where the numbers of people in Pigford 1 exceeded the number of black farmers in the country. So in Pigford 1, 22,500 claims came in in a country in which there were only 18,000 black farmers in the country when, they, when even the black farmers advocacy groups claimed that there would be two to 3,000 claims in total because there were only, um, because there were only 3,000 black farmers who even had paperwork with the USDA. But what happened was is that the head of the Black Farmers Association, there were two of them, National Black Farmers Association, led by John Boyd, and the Black Farmers and Agriculturists Association, led by Thomas Burrell, acted as cappers. There are people that were acting in the interest of the class action law firms and searching, seeking out uh, as many claimants as they could find. They did so at fish fries, they did in the south, they did so in the churches. And we'll tell you this here now. Here and now. We have audio of how one of those individuals uh, uh, pitched people how to defraud the government. Um, it's, this, is as ex this makes Acorn look like a children's amusement park ride you know, at, at the county fair. Uh, the person teaches people the first thing that you need to know, because I've said that the black farmers were just, you know, lost their property and they were supposed to be brought justice. He teaches these people in the black churches how to get his money, how, how to get their $50,000. And the first thing that this individual teaches them 
is if you say on the application that you farmed, you're not going to get your money. You attempted to farm. And then for three and a half hours, he teaches them how to defraud the government. For instance, he says, uh, if your father or your grandfather attempted to farm between 1983 and 1997, you can get your money. The person raises his hand and says, uh, my father worked at a sawmill. He says, yes. And he worked at a sawmill because he attempted to farm and they wouldn't let him farm. He goes, oh, that's very interesting. Or your grandmother. Your grandmother told you on her deathbed that she attempted to farm between 1983 and 1997. Oh, that's very interesting. And so we, the FBI has known about this. We have FBI affidavits from investigations in the year 2004. Uh, the FBI investigation was on the verge of multiple indictments, but they were pulled off for political purposes. We have the proof in, that the head architect of Pigford, Al Pires, uh, was working with a person who worked for the USDA to create a false uh, claims mill out of uh, an Arkansas Farm Service Agency operation that defrauded the government out of tens of millions of dollars and made the lead counsel in Pigford a millionaire 10, 20 times over. So the top lawyer who was picked by Charles Ogletree to join the reparations dream team rigged the process within the government to defraud the government for his own self-benefit. Uh, if you don't believe my narrative of this, uh, if you think that what I'm saying sounds kind of outlandish, perhaps you should talk to Dr. Ridgely A. Muhammad, the Minister of Agriculture for the Nation of Islam and the Vice President of the Black Farmers Association, who uh, has done a documentary called the snakes in the reparations grass, anatomy of a scam. And his documentary that he made from the year 2000 recognized that the black farmers were screwed over in order to make it so that the, uh, to make it so that the uh, class action attorneys would get rich off of the back of the farmers. And what happened is, is that they made a pact with the Congressional Black Caucus that these $50,000 checks would be of immense benefit as walk-around money. Uh, you know, and 22,500 checks within the rural black south became a pretty strong argument that the Democratic Party was bringing, uh, you know, the money back to the community. Well, this is how it ties to modern Barack Obama, the presidency, and how he won the presidency in the South Carolina primary, which was, you know, highly contested, and there was a 50-50 split between support of the rural black uh, population between Hillary and, uh, and Barack Obama. The head of the National Black Farmers Association, a capper who's getting paid by the, uh, the law firms uh, that are becoming millionaires many times over through speaking fees, sent a letter to Barack Obama saying that if you uh, sign on to Pigford, we can help you get elected. He became, to his own, in his own words, he became an advisor to the Obama campaign. We've got pictures of him at the Obama, you know, at, at the Obama headquarters. He's told it to people. He ends up telling him, we need you to help us extend the statute of limitation for the late filers, people that didn't get in in the first phase of Pigford because they filed too late. That took the number from 22,500 filers to 94,000 filers, okay? At 22,500, we were already at a point of absurdity. At 94,000, it was now a new group of people, three times, three and a half times the amount of the original claimants who would now be getting walking around money in the South. That became the narrative that, were, that, was, that was told by these community organizing groups saying, Barack Obama is going to get you this money. And I would argue that that's how he got elected in the primaries in, in, in the South. In fact, when Shirley Sherrod was fired that same week, they pulled out the $1.15 billion out of a supplementary war funding bill where they had sneaked it in because nobody was talking about it. They fired her because she was involved in Pigford at the highest levels and worked. She wasn't just getting money. She worked for the Pigford Monitor, which oversees 
the auditing of Pigford. So she right. was the fox guarding the hen house. She saw that the numbers didn't add 